everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for um, getting in with us and just wanting to hear what Tara Tang has to say today. She's part of our, uh, our team, Love Looks Like Something, and we're here to um, invite you to be a part of what we're doing around the world. And Tara, um, I want to start with you. I want to introduce you first. Um, and then I'm going to introduce everybody else that's on the panel. I met Tara almost a year ago when I went to photograph her for her campaign as Miss World Canada. And I fell in love with her after two minutes being on the phone with her. And you're going to love her too. I guarantee it. Um, she is about turning her crown into real riches. I promise you. You're going to see that. And um, just a little bit after that phone call, I went up to Vancouver to photograph her for her campaign. And I was forever changed by this girl. And I just love her to death. Tara, say hi. Hi, everybody. That was uh, quite the introduction. Thanks, Annette. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being on this. And thank you so much for um, agreeing to um, inspire people, even outside of um, what you're already doing. That just, ministers so much to my heart. Mm, okay. Marika um, Seward, she's my next friend on here and I met her a few years ago through a friend and she is a top recording artist from Canada and has had a few top 10 hits. Um, one of my favorites is Soldier um, and she's going to play one of her newest songs today called Unstoppable. Say hi Marika. Hi everybody. <laughs> Dave is my next friend on the panel, and um, he is an angel. <laughs> Sorry, Dave, I had to say that. Um, I love Dave Bell, and he is one of um, the most inspirational people in my life and has helped me so much, prayed for me, and he is our technical guy today, and he's hopefully going to join us on our other shows. Meet Dave Bell. He is from Heritage Singers. And he's also a college professor. Dave Bell, say hi. Welcome. It's great to be here. Always, always enjoy it when I can get together with Annette and any of her friends. And uh, she's an inspiration to all of us. And just a privilege to, to, to be in, in the bunch here today. My next friend is Casey Dubs, and um, she's my newest friend of all of you, and um, she uh, inspires my heart at least 20 times a day. <laughs> um, she goes to my church with me, and we both share the same vision, the same heart. Uh, we, we always call ourselves, we joke and say we're spiritual twins. Um, love her to death. This is Casey Dubs. Hi. <laughs> Um, she has uh, my um, website address underneath her name um, because I couldn't get the bottom third, but that's my website address, heartforafrica.org. I'm the co-founder with my really cute husband, Mike, um, for Heart for Africa, and you'll learn more about me in weeks to come, but today we want to talk to Tara Tang, and um, she's leaving tomorrow mm. for uh, New Zealand to um, go and talk to the people in New Zealand about sex trafficking, bring awareness, show them what um, they can do to um, fight sex trafficking, and bring value back to human life again. Um, Tara, I just want to first start off, before you start telling us about your trip tomorrow to New Zealand, I wanted to ask you, what was it that began this mission in your heart to um, to to go for this one particular area of slavery in in the world when there's so many things that you could do with your life? You know, you could pick almost anything, and your heart is so full of love, you could do almost any of those things, right? What was it about sex trafficking um, that grabbed you? Mm. Um, well, there's a number of things. This this really has been um, a journey that I've been on for a really long time. And um, I think it really, I can pinpoint it starting when I was about 12 years old. And um, I watched, I was this nerdy 12-year-old kid. I always have been. <laughs> I love watching documentaries and just the stories and the people that it would, in, these um, 
documentaries would introduce me to. And so I, um, I watched this one documentary that I remember, and it was called Bangkok Girl. And if anyone out there from Canada is watching and you watch the CBC, it was the longest-running documentary ever on uh, CBC's The Passionate Eye. And so it was just an opportunity. Um, I remember watching this film, and there was one point in particular where the young girl whose story this was about, she was a young woman trapped in the sex trade in Bangkok, Thailand, she looked directly into the camera lens, and it was almost like she had popped out of the screen and we were sitting across the table from one another. And she just said, no one cares about me. And that was it, and she just brushed off the comment. And it was something that even to this day, I can still hear her voice and see the expression, the hopelessness in her face when she literally believed that she was only worth what people would pay for her, that her life had no value outside of something that someone can just use and abuse. And, um, and it was around that same time that I found out that my family, who also has Asian heritage, we, um, we have family members who are very dear to us who, had they been born female, a girl child, they would have been sold into some form of human exploitation, some form of modern day slavery, um, but they were born a boy and then they were seen as valuable. And so those family members I now know and they grew up with us and and they're, you know, they're part of my family and that was just one generation previous. So it really isn't that far removed, but I always thought that because I lived in Canada, that isn't something that I have to deal with. That's a world issue, that's a global injustice and it doesn't really collide with my life on a daily basis. Until I moved into a new community, the community that I live in now. It's a suburb of Vancouver, Canada. And I got to know my neighbors, and I got to know their stories. And I found out that a neighbor of mine had been trafficked, and their daughter had been sold um, by a man who lured her into prostitution by posing as a boyfriend. And she's been missing now for about two decades. And this is not only just my neighbor's daughter, but this is also my best friend's cousin. And so it really impacted my life, and it showed me that this isn't just a third world issue. This is literally something happening in all communities all around the world, and it's just happening in the shadows. And I really strongly believe that not only are we held accountable for our actions, but we're accountable for what we know about and choose not to take action on. We choose to ignore. And I really, really strongly believe that. And so it's been that conviction that really has become a driving force in my life. And, and it was that decision to use whatever resources I have, whatever platforms that I may have, um, just to speak out about it and to confront what's wrong in the world and multiply what's right. And, and human trafficking, for anyone out there who doesn't know, it, it really is defined as modern day slavery. It is to profit um, off of another person's work or another person's life that you essentially control. And uh, it happens in a variety of different ways. Sex trafficking is just one of them. It is a very very prevalent way, um, but it's just one form. We're also looking at things like labor trafficking. We're looking at things like um, the harvesting and removal of organs on the black market. Anything that, that takes a person's dignity and it turns them from a human being with rights and freedoms into a commodity that can be bought, sold, and profited, exploited for the profit of others, that's human trafficking. And so um, that's what has been my life work for the last almost seven years now. Um, I've been working on it for quite a while in a variety of different forms and different platforms. And um, that's what's going to be taking me to New Zealand tomorrow to be partnering with an organization over there. And, and I'm, I'm excited to see what's going on over there and um, the individuals that I'm going to meet. And I'm just excited to see how the story is going to unfold because I realize that we're all a piece of this. We're all a piece of this puzzle. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, Tara, I remember when you were going into the Miss World competition mm -hmm. and um, I was so impressed with um, your integrity going through that, the whole, you know, if you don't mind me bringing up the bathing suit thing and all sure. of that. Um, I mean, you went all the way to say that, you know what, I don't want to be about a sexy body. I am all about what God's given me to um, do with this this title, and um, I loved how you, even at that level, you were bringing value to women, and, right. and 
you, I think that you might may have even said that if if I can't do it this way, I can't do it. You know, right. the crown didn't mean more to you than your purpose. Right. And I love that about you, Tara. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit, but I, it's really inspiring for people that are on the fence and sure. tempted to do wrong. To, you know what I'm saying? Sure. Uh, I think so. Um, I've I've always said. I mean, this isn't my first crown. <laughs> um, I I first entered the world of pageantry in 2010 when I won the title of Miss British Columbia, which is my province. Um, so I won that title in 2010. I went on to compete at a national level, um, winning the title of Miss Canada 2011. And then uh, when I thought I was done with pageants, I uh, I ended up in one more, which was Miss World Canada 2012. Winning that title brought me to the world stage at the 62nd Miss World pageant, um, which internationally is a huge deal. It's the longest running and it's the largest and the most watched pageant on the planet. So every year, about two billion viewers tune in to watch the big show, the crowning gala of Miss World. And so it, it really is one of the largest stages that a young woman can speak on. Um, and and for me, you know, I, I never was all about, I, I never, as a little girl, I never dreamed about being Miss Canada. I never dreamed about being at Miss World. I actually literally thought that that was always going to be impossible for me. And um, and yet I found myself years ago in 2010 with this opportunity of Miss British Columbia coming before me and I decided that I had always wanted to do it but never had because I had been too afraid because it was out of my comfort zone. It was something that I had never done before and it seemed really scary and I had gone through this period of personal growth where I no longer wanted to allow fear to hold me back. So I took that step and I took that risk and I, I went for it. And I've always said that I'm not a beauty queen, I'm an abolitionist. And that's a big distinction. That's something that is very true to my heart. And I, I don't um, do I don't fight human trafficking and I don't seek justice so that I can win pageant titles. Mm -hmm. I win I seek after winning pageant titles because I want I believe strongly that you know, a lot of people say that I'm a voice for the voiceless, and as nice of a sentiment as that is, I don't necessarily agree with that. Because yes, I have a voice, and Annette, you have a voice, and Marika, you have a voice, and Casey and Dave, you guys all have voices. We all have voices, we all have spheres of influence, we all have platforms, but so does every other person on this planet. And just because I have the privilege of being an educated North American woman living here in Canada who happens to have a pageant title, that doesn't mean it's for me to take away the voices of those who are not being heard around the world. To take away the voices of those who are currently living in poverty or who are oppressed or exploited, they have voices. But right now, nobody's listening to them. Right now, those voices are being overheard or they're being drowned out by the noise or being drowned out as things that we see as more important than them or they're being drowned out and not being heard because they're being held in slavery. And so it's for me to use those platforms to actually amplify the voices of those who aren't being heard, to amplify the voices of those who are being enslaved around the world right now today. And I believe in that so strongly that um, a lot of people who have followed pageants will know that the swimwear competition is a huge part of a lot of pageants. Traditionally that's always something that you always see. And while there's nothing necessarily wrong with that, I personally have always chosen to opt out. I've never taken part in a swimwear competition, um, whether provincially or internationally. It's something that I really strongly believe that um, because of the women that I stand with, the women who are now very dear friends of mine, it's not just a cause that I stand up for, but these are people who I know very well and they often have been sexually exploited in commercial sexual exploitation, the commercial sex trade, or in pornography, or in strip clubs, or in other areas like that where their body has been on display. And so out of solidarity with them, I've always chosen not to take part in that. And, uh, and really a big thing about that is I didn't want to win on account of my looks. I want, and again, there's nothing wrong with being a beautiful girl. I think that one thing I really appreciated at being at Miss World is seeing the diversity when 116 girls from all around the globe come together, just the global beauty and the diversity and the uniqueness that's there. There's nothing wrong with the, the way that God created us. It's something that we should be really proud of. But 
for me, I wanted to win not based on what I look like. I wanted to always win my pageants based on my character and my compassion and my integrity and the fact that hopefully the judges would see me as a leader and the best choice for the job. And, uh, and so that's why I always chose to opt out because I didn't want that confusion. And I've always only ever been part of pageants because I want to seek to expand my platform so that more people can hear the voices and that megaphone can be amplified so they can hear the voices of those who are in, in, in justice right now. Well, that is that is truly commendable, Tara, and um, I applaud you for that. That is so impressive to me, and it tells me um, you're the real deal. Um, when we spent some time together on um, photographing in um, Gastown in Vancouver, um, we were walking along the street, and you had um, one of your gowns on, and um, I'm not sure if you had your sash on at that time, and no. I. Your crown on. Crown but um, I remember um, when we were doing this photo shoot, you really ha were preoccupied with something other than posing as a beauty queen for me. Your preoccupation right. was with the homeless people. We were right. on. Um, I mean, you just you just kept saying, "I want to go to this one place, and I want to go over here." And I had heard that this one place was one of the most dangerous places in Vancouver to go. And um, you said, this is where my people are. These are these are the homeless people that I love. And so we went to that street, and you um, just spoke to a few people there. And, um, you know, what was really impressive is people knew you, and they felt comfortable with you. It was like you were visiting your friends. Mm -hmm. And then we... Yeah. Um, <laughs> I know they are, I know. Um, if anyone were to, um, and I'm sure they do, because we have so many negative people, whenever you do something good, there's stone throwers sure. to discourage you from doing good. Um, and you just have to ignore them, but um, I've never really experienced someone that was as genuinely in love with homeless people like you, Tara, and I, I, I was changed by that. Uh, my life changed because of your example and because of your genuine um, spirit that you shared with them. And the one um, homeless person that we saw that one day that you knelt down to and spoke to like he was, you treated him like he was your brother. Mm -hmm. And I know that you made him happy for at least three weeks <laughs> just thinking about you. Um, and that ministered to me so much. I really wish I could show that picture. Dave, I don't know if you can bring up the pictures that I uploaded to the event, but I did put a picture of that on there, if you could show that on the screen. Um, it was one of those moments, Tara, when I really feel like your voice was heard the loudest because um, I, I know that the angels were celebrating in heaven because you stooped down and you looked right in his eyes and you just stayed there for I don't know how long it was, it could have been 15 minutes, telling him how valuable he was, yeah. telling him how much you loved him. And the thing that I really, really love about your life, Tara, is that you refuse to cause, call anyone common. Mm. Uh, and, and, and the thing is, is whatever we call common, we also despise. Right. And, um, and it's almost like, Tara, you've taken people and given them the courage to take themselves off the discount rack of life mm. and to be the valuable person that God created them to be and to live from their designer, from what their designer made them to be. And you've empowered them and encouraged them to step up get themselves off of the discount rack of life and start treating themselves the way their creator treat, treats them, which is with value, with love, with respect. Um, and I honor that in your life, Tara. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, oh, Dave, did you get um, yeah, that, that picture? One? Yes, that's the one. This was not planned. This is something we were just walking by. And I didn't notice the guy because he was sitting down low, and I, I was looking at another place, but Tara noticed him. And she sat down next to him, 
and just looked into his eyes and and loved on him for 15 minutes and by the time we were leaving this man was crying and he was laughing and he was just so full of joy and the other homeless man that was talking to me he was very angry at us because he was like who are you he was very suspicious of us but he also was full of joy knowing that this girl was the real deal and he said that to me too he said this is the real deal Tara did we lose you I think we did let's hope that she gets back in I have three of her too um, you know what while we're while we're waiting for her to come in um, Marika um, you've been friends with Tara for a while and you're like one of her mentors I love that about you because you mentor a lot of people. Um, I would love it if you would just introduce that song that you wrote, Unstoppable. If you want to play it for us right now, this would be a good time since we lost Tara. Um, but maybe you can tell us what what inspired this song. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about the song and then play it for us. We'd love to hear it. Sure. Let me let me grab my guitar while I explain. Um, you know, one of the cool things about when I met Tara, and Tara and I met actually because she was doing her Miss BC fundraiser, and, um, you know, she was running the event herself, and one of my artists was playing for her. And when I met her, we got to know each other, and we found out we actually are really about the same things, which is really, um, you know, especially bringing value to women. Um, uh, you know, I mean, we absolutely, you know, something Tara says is the value of human life is immeasurable, which I completely agree with. And I think my passion in the entertainment industry is that even women, like, I don't know if you guys saw the latest um, Oscars and just how women were just so degraded. And this is a joke. It's not, it doesn't get any better. Um, but we just, we have a, just a, a shared passion for really bringing value to women. And so um, this song, Unstoppable, I wrote when it was actually a really, um, I, I want to say low, but it wasn't low. It was just, it was a time when I was really just um, really asking God, you know, can we be integral, um, uh, integral, you know, confident women in the entertainment industry and, and sh you know, share that voice that human life is immeasurable. And my good friend Grace Sung, who's also uh, one of our artists and a good, good friend of mine, we just sat down at the piano and started writing this song. It just really is about, um, you know, anything really is possible um, when you believe God for your goals and for your dreams. And, you know, Tara and I are just talking about doing an, an unstoppable tour in the fall and where we just bring in some of our friends, kind of like how she said, you know, everyone has a voice, and it's not just about us that have platforms, but really empowering other people to do it. And so this is a song that kind of just keeps you going when it gets hard. <laughs> but hopefully she'll be back with us. <laughs> but this is called Unstoppable. in the wrong game. Whoa, that never happens. I'm sorry, Ed. I'm so embarrassed. No one can stop me now. If they try, no one can bring me down. Cause I'm not going under. I see these broken shadows. The only made me stronger. She's my only other I'm unstoppable Remembering a time When I Was afraid So I'm free to try Then I heard Heard a word calling my name You are my rescue now Strength divine No one can stop me now if they try, no one can bring me down. Cause I'm not going under. I see these broken shadows. They only make me stronger. Since my only other, I'm unstoppable. The mountains I have climbed, they will 
impossible. Seems so impossible. In the spaces of my mind, I have strived. I try to make my way. You are my rescue now. Strength in my No one can stop me now. If they try, no one can bring me down. Cause I'm not going under. I see this broken shadow. They only make me stronger. She's my only other. I'm unstoppable. Unstoppable. did lose Tara. She's trying really hard to get back in. She's texting me right now. Um, Dave, she says that the page keeps going blank on her. I think she's trying to get back in again. Um, oh, I could I see her pop up. Anyways, we'll try to get Tara back. Um, but while we're trying to get her back, um, Marika, um, we weren't planning on um, you know, talking today about your career. Oh, Tara's back. We we can talk in a little bit, Marika. Tara, welcome back. Yay. Sorry. Marika <laughs> just played a song, the unstoppable song. I, I heard it, sort of. <laughs> yeah. I would hear like words okay, and then my the page would go later. blank and I get kicked out. <laughs> Sorry about that, Tara. Um hopefully it won't happen again. Uh anyways, Tara, um maybe um you could tell us a little bit about what is in the future for you. Um, are you going for another crown, or is this no. it? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can't go any bigger, huh? No, you can't go any bigger, and I'm done, for sure. <laughs> okay. Um, so what, what? Pageants were never my focus, and uh, it's been a good three years. It's been a good chapter, but I'm definitely ready to move on. Okay, and so um, what do you see going, what do you see um, happening in the near future for you? Do you know? Or are you kind of waiting to figure well, that out? I'm waiting to see a few details and how everything plays out in the next little bit, next year or so. But the biggest thing is that um, I, I, I work full time to combat human trafficking. That's my passion. And professionally, I'm a public speaker. And I love those two things so much. That's where my heart is. So I just want to dive into to that and focus on that for the next few years and um, kind of see where the, the road leads from there and see uh, kind of how... Yeah, God guides the journey. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hmm. Well, I have heard you speak before, and it is quite incredible. It's definitely a gift. Um, one of the things that I noticed when I was watching the Miss Canada pageant is the answer to the question. <laughs> uh, I knew that you were speaking from your heart. It wasn't. It wasn't in your head. A lot of a lot of the girls are talking from their education and from what they know in their head. Uh, your answer was so perfect. Um, it, I knew it came straight from your heart. There was it was so amazing. Um, anyways, if you're on again, Tara, we lost you for a second. Right. Um, uh, about your public speaking, what uh, what do you like to speak about? Uh, well, human trafficking, <laughs> ending, uh, seeking justice, ending slavery, that's that's my passion. That's what I talk about. I talk about that and, and all the things uh, about that, giving people, ordinary people, resources to be involved in that. And I think especially uh, when we talk to um, people who share our share faith, um, people who want to live Jesus style, um, I think that there's something really important there. Because it says um, in the Bible, if you follow the Bible, it says that the foundation of God's throne is righteousness and justice. And so I know that if you're a person of faith, then you really can't not have justice be part of your life, the pursuit of justice. Because if those are the things that are closest to God's heart, 
and you want to be living a life that is pursuing after God's heart, then you have, we have to be pursuing justice as well. And I really think that there isn't, you know, whether whether you believe in that or not, I really think that there's nothing more important in this world than loving God and loving others. Uh, I think that was his commandment. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so uh, anything that I seek to do, I want it to go right back to that. And, and that's why I'm so passionate about justice, because to, to know someone, you have to love them. And, and you, can't, you can't love someone without knowing them, you know? That's like, like you think about it, like I know Marika, you have young kids and, and I'm sure you love every day getting to know who they are as they grow up more and more and seeing who they become and as you see who they, who they are becoming, you probably love them even more every day and, and I think, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I think that that's how that is probably for all people and all of the relationships that we all have in our lives is is that the more that you get to know a person the more that you you have a love for them mm -hmm. and um, and you really can't love someone unless you know them and you know that's the same thing whether it's it's uh, my friends who happen to be currently homeless who don't have a, a residential address right now in Vancouver like Alan who was the man that you and I met in that photograph of me uh, wearing the blue dress you know you, you have to just take the time to get to know people and so um, you know, for me, as as I've been walking this journey of faith and fighting for freedom, I've actually intimately gotten to know. I've shared my life, and they've shared these people who who were once, I guess, stories and statistics in my mind. Um, these people who are living in the midst of modern day slavery, they are some. They are people that I know now, and that we've shared our lives with. And when you when you when you're in that kind of a situation, you know, you fight for what you love. We all do. We all choose to invest in what we love. We spend our time and we spend our days with what we love. And uh, and we will fight for that and we'll pr fiercely protect that. I know that Marika would fiercely fight for and protect her children if ever they're in danger. And that's something that we probably all would do for our family members. You know, so these people have become family and you don't just abandon family. You fight for them and you walk alongside them and you share your life with them. And so that's what I seek to do, whether it's with a platform of a pageant queen or if it's a different platform that's uh, that's what we seek to do you know and I think that it's really interesting because we've titled this um, these hangouts love looks like something well what is that what is that what does love look like and I think um, Dr. Cornell West says it best when he says justice is what love looks like in public yeah. because when you love someone you care about their well-being and you care about if they're being taken advantage of. You care about if they're being oppressed, if they're victims of violence. You care about if they're being enslaved. And so you will fight for them because you love them. And justice is simply that. Justice is simply caring about the well-being of another person and, and making sure that people are being cared for justly. It's making sure that their lives are valued. It's making sure that their lives are respected. And you care about what happens to them. And that's simply what justice is. And so... Um, yeah. Can I add something into that? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I think too, um, what we're learning, Annette, and what I've kind of learned just from walking this last, two, um, I guess, three years with Tara, is that people, people aren't educated on what justice actually means. And I think what we've, what we've kind of experienced is that Tara goes and speaks somewhere and they're like, oh, good for you, Tara. Like, we'll write a check. What do you need? Where that's not the point. And I know that's not Tara's heart either. Um, when she goes and speaks, she really wants people, um, especially believers, to really just um, step up and in a way that is actually taking action, sort of, sort of acting on the love that they know. Um, because a lot of the times, like even for me, when I first met Tara, I didn't know a lot about human trafficking, um, to be honest. And I didn't know a lot about how, it, you know, even how it happened in Canada. And what I think, when the more that I got educated and the more that I got resources, and even today I'm like, Jared, you know, what, what, where can we learn more about this stuff? Um, the more people will rally to action. Because, you know, as I, when I go speak, I tell all the women that I speak to, if women would just spend a tenth of the time that they spend thinking about their weight, on you know on justice and on love and on acting on that they would change the world we would change the world 
Um, and, you know, again, it's just really educating them on what love looks like. And I think that's why this is so cool because it, it's actually another resource um, that we can share. Like, this is what justice looks like. It's not getting our banners and standing on the parliament buildings, which it is that sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not every day. <laughs> but not every day. But it's, it's as simple as, you know, taking clothes down to the homeless shelter. And everybody can do that. Um, or buying fair trade coffee instead of coffee run by big corporations around the world. You know, it, it's it's little things like that. It's it's living, learning how to live justly. It's a lifestyle change. You don't just do justice. We live justice, mm -hmm. and that takes real commitment, yeah. and it's a lot that's harder. That's, 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 yeah, yeah, because it is. It's it's changing the way we do life. Yeah. Um, to do differently to change the world. Yeah. You know, um, Tara and Marika, um, not sure if you two, I'm, I'm pretty sure you know the verse that, that Jesus uh, challenged us with that uh, if you give a cup of water to the least of these or you, um, yeah. uh, you, know, you know what verse I'm talking to, yeah. you've done it to me. Um, I take that pretty seriously, and um, I really, you know, I always knew that verse, and I always, you know, I, I was raised on the Bible, and I know it, um, but I didn't really know it until I did it, um, and so people that are talking Bible verses don't impress me so much. It's the people that are doing the verses. Yeah, living. But one time I was in Africa, and I put a little orphan on my, my lap. And I'm not kidding. It was like I put Jesus on my lap. His eyes pierced my heart with so much joy. I finally knew I had a knowing that was so strong of who Jesus was. Because I was doing, Jesus said, if you do this to the least of these, you've done it to me. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had that fellowship with Jesus by loving on that orphan and and then when I went away from Africa I knew that I knew that I knew I knew Jesus I knew the word you know and I know um, Tara you've probably had experiences like that do you want to share any do you have any moments where you've just like I know Jesus now <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think uh, for me um, you know, just going back a little bit for those of you who might be listening in or a part of our chat that um, don't know much about me. This is maybe your first time meeting me. Um, I grew up in a, a, a home of uh, people who believed in Jesus and wanted to live his way. Um, and uh, I went to church my whole life and Sunday school and the whole deal. But I, I would say I didn't really meet Jesus until I was probably in my early 20s. And um, it was actually after I, uh, I left the church and I walked away from my faith for a number of years. And then uh, I remember I, I was attending a, a Christian university, Christian Liberal Arts University, uh, which I graduated from. And um, I remember I was there and I was... Uh, we were in chapel one day, and I was kind of living this, like, I was living like a Christian. Uh, I believed in God. I never said, I never ever walked away from my faith in God. I just kind of walked away, took a breather from Christianity, and I took a breather from church and Christians. And uh, But I was going to this Christian university and kind of figuring out what I thought of everything. And in chapel, there was this guy one day, and he came in, and he had ripped baggy jeans and, you know, a big old brown hoodie that looked like he had worn it for years and a blue bandana and long dreadlocks. And uh, he was from Philadelphia, but he spoke this, like, Tennessee accent. He's this kind of skinny, scrawny white kid with big thick rim glasses and and maybe some of you might know who I'm talking about but it was Shane Claiborne and he was there and he's the author of uh, The Irresistible Revolution and he's the founder of The Simple Way in Philadelphia and um, and he started talking about this Jesus who who was this revolutionary guy who came to earth to actually change things. He came to earth because 
Um, God cared so much about the people who lived here and cared about what their lives and what happened to them and had a better plan for their life and actually wanted to see them thrive and he saw the injustice that was going on in the world and it broke his heart because he intimately cared about these people and he cared about what happened to them and so it, Jesus came to earth with this mission to restore shalom and maybe you've never heard of the term shalom but if you go back to the Hebrew Bible to the Jewish Bible um, which is also part of the Christian Old Testament and you go back to that in shalom is this concept of making right what is wrong in the world it is the way that God when he thought of the world and he thought of humanity living it and he thought of the way that he wanted to interact with people that were living and breathing on the earth this is what he pictured he pictured this world where neighbors knew one another where people cared for one another where there no one was without need where there was no such thing as poverty where there was no such thing as hunger where there was no such thing as gender inequality where there was no such thing as greed and and maybe to the cynic the this seems impossible. Maybe we're talking about this utopia that, that exists in fantasy but not in reality, but the shalom was the way that God originally intended the world to look like. And yet we all know that people aren't perfect and the world isn't perfect and that isn't our reality this present day. But the whole reason why Jesus came back to earth is to restore the world, take away what was wrong in the world, and restore it back to what God originally had for us, which is this picture of shalom, this picture of um, wholeness. It's this picture of joy. It's this picture of justice. It's this picture of grace. It's this picture of love. And, um, and the way that we achieve that is through Jesus, and that's the whole reason why he came. And I had never actually heard things put that sort of way before. I had never heard about this Jesus or this idea of Christianity that actually it wasn't about what I did right and it wasn't about what I did wrong and it wasn't about when I went to church or whether or not I swore or or it wasn't about any of those do this don't do that judgmental kind of checklists it was literally just about love and justice and and making broken things whole again and and it was literally just about grace and this was the Jesus that I had never ever met before and and when I when I finally started to hear about this kind of Jesus and I started to get to know him and I started to stop saying well what does it mean to be a Christian but rather started saying questions like who is Jesus really what did he really say what did he really do and then what does that apply what does that mean for my life um, that changed everything and, and that was the, the moment that I guess I first met Jesus and, and that was when I, I realized that this is a Jesus that I can get on board with and this is a Jesus that makes sense to me because this isn't a list of rules and do's and don'ts anymore and this isn't I go to church on Sunday and youth group on Friday night this is this is honestly something that can, has the potential of changing the world yeah, it's that. a transforming, it's the only, if you want to call it a religion, I don't like to, but if you want to call it religion, it's the only one that transforms. Yeah, well, and, and in James, if you look up in the Bible, if you're familiar, maybe I'm just throwing out a bunch of uh, numbers and names right now for people who are listening and who might not. No, but if you were to look up the Bible, towards the end of the book, uh, there's this one chapter called James, and it is, it's chapter 1 of that book, of that section, and 27 is the specific verse. And if you go and look at that, it says that true religion is to take care of widows and orphans in their distress. Um, that's what, because it, going back to well, what does love look like, justice is what love looks like in public, well, if you seek to know God, if you seek to know his heart, and this is where his heart is, if he cares so deeply about people that he would actually come to earth because he cares about them, well then shouldn't we be going to our neighbors across the street? And shouldn't we be going to children who are literally orphaned in Africa? You know, and, and as I've been learning more about that verse, even that word widow means so much more than I originally thought it meant. Because widow Yes, it means women who have been widowed, or maybe men who have been widowed, or the single mom in our community. Maybe it does literally mean all those things. But if you look back in history, 
before women had rights to vote, before women were considered persons, if you weren't a widow, if you were a widow, then that meant you didn't have a husband. If you didn't have a husband, you didn't have a voice. Because in the community, then you didn't have someone to speak up for you. And there's something incredibly profound about that. This is why God wants us to look after widows and orphans in their distresses, because these are often the ones who, are, who suffer the most injustice widows and orphans because they don't have the protection of somebody else and they're just left out and they're vulnerable and they can be just picked on by anybody who wants to pick on them and that's why you see when if we go back to the, the issue of say human trafficking and we look at widows and orphans the majority of victims of human trafficking are young children most of them are, are minors and about eighty percent of all victims in the world are female they're often yeah. women who don't have voices who aren't being heard, they don't, they don't have the rights or, or their, their rights have been taken away from them. And the same thing about these children. And so I, I think that there's something really important there when the author of, in James 2, um, 1 at 27 is saying, true religion that God accepts that is pure and blameless is one who takes care, care of widows and orphans. And, and I really think that, that what he's talking about there is to look at, take care of people who don't have voices, who are being oppressed. And it's pure and it's and seen as pu religion that's pure and blameless is because we do it because we don't, we can't get anything from them. Widows and orphans can't have, they have nothing to repay us. You don't do it to get something. You know, and the true character of a person is what the, the compassion that they do for those who cannot serve their ego, their status, or their agenda. That's the true character of a person, and that's true compassion. And often the, those are the things that you don't see. And you might see me going and working to end human trafficking because I have a platform which just helps me bring in more people to the same cause and helps them see the resources that they have. But the real heroes in this fight are people whose names will probably never be known by the masses because they're people who who live amongst those who are poor and those who are impoverished and those who are exploited around the world and they give day in and day out for this you know and those are the people that I partner with around the world and I just want to take the time to honor them because they give and nobody ever sees it and that's not why they give but it's just amazing and and when I I walk with them I see that picture of Shalom and so I know that the cynic might say, well, it's never going to be possible. But I absolutely believe that it is. And in fact, Jesus promises that we will get back to that image of Shalom, the way that God intended things to be. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but it's going to happen. Good. Tara, you're preaching me happy. <laughs> I love this so much. Um, I love that you're doing love. It, it is powerful. And this is why people listen to you because your only agenda is to love people mm -hmm. and just like you said earlier um, when you love somebody you have an inroads to their heart and they listen to what you say um, I know a lot of people that know and have memorized so much of the Bible but they have no inroads to hearts because right. they don't have love Right. Um, I believe that you should elevate love above all because that was the commandment Jesus um, gave us. Um, he summed it all up with love. And I think that a lot of people go back to religious duty. They go back to law because love requires so much more. Yeah. You know? You, yeah. you can't hurt somebody when you're loving them. You yeah. can't sin against them. You can't take advantage of them. You can't do all of the things, that, the sins of the mind or the heart, yeah. the motives. You can't do sin when you're in love. Mm -hmm. And that's why love is elevated above everything. Um, I was asking God the other day why there, there's this organization that is flourishing. Mm -hmm. And I asked him, I said, why are they flourishing so much, God? What's their secret? And he said, because they elevate the word above everything. Mm. And then I went, what? And he goes, they elevate my command above everything. And I went, what? And then I was starting to get it, and he goes, above everything else they love. And I went, oh, wow. Okay, 
um, this is helping all of my religious thinking just yeah. go out the door. Yeah. And, um, anyways, you've helped us think differently, Tara, today. Um, thank you so much. I know you've got to run in five minutes. Do you have to meet your person in five minutes, or can we go <laughs> on a more? Uh, yeah, well, I think we have a... Well, maybe we'll just hear a couple thoughts from okay, some of the yeah. other people. Yeah, yeah, Casey. I just want to make sure that um, the book you mentioned, was that uh, Irresistible Revolution? Yeah, it's The Irresistible Revolution by Shane Claiborne, in case anybody out there who's listening uh, wants to check it out. I highly, highly re recommend it. I, I've and copied that into the event. No, yeah, so highly recommended. And uh, I'm working on a book list of some of my other favorites that I'll be posting yes, in is. the next few days on um, onto my uh, blog, which is taratang.wordpress.com. So you can check that out as well, too, because uh, I know there, if you're interested in these kind of things, then you might uh, want to check out a few other books that will hopefully inspire you, too. Casey, um, I just want to hear your reaction because I know you're probably ready to just come through the screen and kiss Tara on the face because I know you. <laughs> it is true. It's just speaking to my heart. But, um, I mean, one thing that really stood out to me is that God designed every person with their own uh, special set of gifts and something mm -hmm. about them to fulfill in their life and their own plan and their own purpose. And it's just sad that there are people who find themselves voiceless out there and um, they don't see the great treasure that's inside of them that God designed them to be and and they never they never quite attain it and they lose their hope uh, even for a possibility of it. And so I think it's just so important um, and one of the reasons why it's so dear to God's heart to for us to go out there and show people um, what love looks like and what's inside of them and um, you know and show them the God of the universe that created them and that loves them and really restore some some hope in people and uh, bring them life you know instead of uh, stealing stealing and killing and destroying giving them life and a hope for a future Mm -hmm. so I, I think it's great. <laughs> yeah. 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 I just want to add, like, I know um, the content of what Tara talks about is really serious because it is a serious issue. I think that when we talk about, like, going and doing something that involves action and involves, like, love in action, um, I think it always comes across very serious. Like, you've got to give up this and give up that. And it's actually really fun. And you guys know that. Yeah. You know, Annette, Tara, and, you know, Dave, I've seen you in action doing your thing, too. And, um, you know, I'm Casey, I just know you're like that, too, because Annette wouldn't have you around if, if you weren't like that. <laughs> but I think people need to know it's really fun when you're actually doing what you're called to do, going after your dreams and, and doing them to help, to you know, basically just because that's what we're made to do. And other people are changed by it and they're impacted by it. It, it is fun. And so I don't want to make it sound like, oh, my gosh, this drudgery of us. Yeah. Being. Like, uh, you know, there's there's no there's no better way to live life um, than living life loving. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you can quote me on that, but um, <laughs> I don't know. I, even this stuff, like as I said, I, to, to be a mom with kids talking about human trafficking, and I've told Tara I need to take it in like little bits at a time because it is intense. You think of, you know, a little girl, um, you know, being sex trafficked. It's intense, especially for moms, I think, to grasp their heads around it. Um, but the more that um, Tara and I hang out and the more that we all have conversations, just the more ideas God gives to be creative and to do things that are, you know, everybody has gifts, everyone has talents, even if they don't think they do, um, to really impact these people, um, you know, on a local scale and a global scale. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. One thing I – oh, go ahead, Tara. No, I was just going to say, if I can even, like, add on to what Marika said, like, when you are doing justice, just simply think of it as – um, yeah, we're changing our lifestyle to live justly and to care about those who are around us, but we're simply just opening up our hearts and we're opening up our lives to expand our friend and our family circle. That's all we're doing because if we go back to the idea of to know someone, to love someone, you have to know them. 
and to be able to fight for them and fight for their justice, you have to love them. You're literally just opening up your life and expanding your friend circle and expanding your, your family circle. And and family and friends mean crazy good times, <laughs> you know. And, and one of my favorite memories ever, you know, you were talking about the little boy who crawled into your lap, the little child who crawled into your lap in Africa. One of my favorite moments is when I was in Bangkok, Thailand, and I was with these women. This was summer of 2011 with the women of Rehab Ministries Thailand who are one of my partner organizations and they work with women to help them exit the sex trade in Bangkok and give them really viable solutions um, to sustain themselves in their future so that to give them a hope in a future that doesn't mean that they're going to be living in poverty anymore so they can actually protect themselves and their children it's really powerful so we were we were up in this um, building and it's the fourth story in uh, literally the middle of the red light district in Thailand and uh, and we're in this tiny little space and these women there and they make jewelry and they and they they all kinds of cool stuff and um, uh, we were there, and we were there with a band, and they cooked this massive dinner. Like, there's this huge spread of home-cooked Thai food, which is, like, my favorite food in the world. And we all shared a meal together, and then after our meal, um, she just, they, they, we started playing music. And we started, um, the band started singing these songs, and these women recognized the songs. And uh, they started singing along in Thai. We were singing in English, and they were singing in Thai. And there is a sound that freedom has. And it's beautiful. And it is joyous. And I would even dare say it's an unstoppable sound. And uh, there's something just really cool about it. These women who have been through more than I can even comprehend. And they were just singing at the top of their lungs. And it was beautiful. You know, so there's a lot of fun that comes involved with seeking to live justly and to getting to know those who are around us and to fighting for their freedom. There are beautiful things that happen along the way, so we shouldn't be afraid of it because it's powerful and it's beautiful and it's restoring shalom in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Shara, that's good. <laughs> that's good. I've, I've been over there in those areas, and I have to say that um, I... I feel like I never lived until I went to yeah. Africa. And um, I, I want to um, tell you just a little story really quick. Um, a little girl, so if any, anybody out in YouTube land or uh, Google Plus land is thinking about doing something with their life um, that will add significance and value and you want to give love a face like Tara has, um, I was um, over in Africa once, and I was uh, holding this little girl. Her name's Clarice, and um, she whispered in my ear. She just said the most simplest thing to me because we had just she had just gotten uh, sponsored through our organization, Heart for Africa, and she whispered in my ear. She's like 12 or 13 years old. She goes. Why does somebody that doesn't know me want to send me to school? Mm -hmm. And I almost just started crying. Like, she got that. She was like, someone in another part of the world that I've never met wants to send me to school. Why? Mm -hmm. and, um, and she goes, they love me more than my own family. I mean, she, she interpreted that as love because that's what the kids over in Africa want to do most. They want to go to school. That, we met little glue boys on the side of the street who were sniffing glue, and they were high. And um, they even being high on glue, they said, we just want to go to school. We just want to go to school. And, and, and so the interviewer said, would you give me your glue if we – took you to school, they said yes, yeah. you know, um, anyways, the things that are important in Africa are just, it's like mind-boggling, it's relationship, love, the, the feeling of love is so important to them, relationship is number one, um, I believe that's why they're the most spiritual people on the planet, mm -hmm. and that's why we see a lot of miracles over there too, uh, they get it. Uh, anyways, Tara, thank you again for inspiring us. Um, you're going to be back on the show every time, hopefully, if you're not traveling. Uh, <laughs> or even if I'm traveling. A <laughs> broadcast from Sri Lanka. Yeah, she's going to do that. She's sure. <laughs> we'll take her here with us. 
Yeah. Well, I'm from uh, China, I can broadcast. They don't like me in China. Oh, yeah. That's another story. We'll talk about that next That's time. That's next time. That's part two, Tara J. <laughs> we look forward to the stories you're going to come back from New Zealand with. Mm -hmm. um, we are going to pray for you that you touch many lives, um, that many people come awake. <laughs> they wake up to reality, what's happening. And that they're inspired to go out and give love a face um, and actually be um, what they're preaching. Yeah. Uh, that's so important, to be what you're preaching. Um, it's so important. And thank you, Tara, for being that. You've inspired us today. Thank you so it's much. my journey. Just sharing my journey. <laughs> yeah. yeah, really. I want to go to New Zealand with you. All right. <laughs> I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> Marika, thank you so much for being uh, on. Thank you for your song. We'll talk with you more next time about your um, career and your life calling and God in your life and all that stuff, too. Thank you so much. No problem. Dave, thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dave. Hero, Dave. Hero. You're an internet hero. Dave, we might, we might have you sing a heritage singer song. Oh. <laughs> you might ask me to do the solo. <laughs> I'll do the high parts, Dave. You can do the low parts. <laughs> and Casey, thank you so much. Um, before we go, Dave, do you want to show a few pictures of Tara? Oh, I like that, Tara. That's your little thing um, uh, that talks about your New Zealand trip. Yeah, that's just uh, just the poster for the New Zealand tour, so you guys can be thinking about that, praying about that, uh, where you have four different uh, city stops across the country, and it's going to be exciting. A lot of people apparently in New Zealand don't know a big difference between um, human smuggling and human trafficking, so we're hoping to clear that up for a lot of people. And we're hoping to uh, get the government involved with the conversation too and expand the current definition of human trafficking to include coercion, manipulation, and fraud as tactics that traffickers use and also to include um, in the criminal code something for domestic human trafficking because right now um, New Zealand nationals aren't protected under the law if they were to be exploited so that's what we're hoping to do and hopefully it'll be a really successful trip it will, Tara. With you there and God, you're the majority. It's going to be great. <laughs> awesome. And then I just want to end the show with a few of your inspirational pictures. You being you. Dave, you have some of those. Um, yes. I love this one right here. Where was this I like them all. <laughs> um, that one is in Vancouver, it's in Chinatown, and we're reenacting what Tara does, rescuing little girls from, um, from slavery. Can you put it back up, Dave? Uh, it should still be there. There, there we go. Uh, and is this Vancouver also? Mm-hmm. Are there, how many do you have in here? Uh, no, that's, that was the last of that. One more is her in the forest with the children. That, that was the first one I had. I can go back to that. Yeah. Hold on. I think you can, everyone can see these on Google Plus later too there if they is. wanna. Sapphire pages. Yeah. So, um, yeah. There, there's yeah. the forest. Beautiful art artistry by Annette Biggers of Triple Chord Photography. No big deal. No big deal. <laughs> so actually a big deal. <laughs> Thank you everyone for watching today. We'll see you next time and we'll let you know when our next uh, Love Looks Like Something um, show is on and aired. We'll have other people on as well, but this will be our main little um, uh, panel of people. So we enjoyed today and I hope you did too. Have a great week everybody and go change the world. Show the world what's possible. Bye. Bye. Bye.